Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. Americans are angry. Baseball players spit on umpires. Drivers make obscene gestures. Family members duke it out on daytime television. Whatever happened to civility? Some say our manners have gotten worse. Well, if that's true, what, if anything, should be done about it? There's an important argument about civility, and sometimes it's not so civil. Our guests today are Stephen Carter, professor of law at Yale University and author of the new book, Civility, Manners, Morals, and the Etiquette of Democracy, and Benjamin DeMott, former professor at Amherst College and author of a much discussed article, Seduced by Civility, that appeared in The Nation magazine. Professor DeMott is also author of the book, The Trouble with Friendship, Why Americans Can't Think Straight About Race. Being civil about civility, this week on Think Tank. Those who say civility has worsened come armed with plenty of examples. Mike Tyson biting the ear of Evander Holyfield, profane so-called shock jocks, road rage, rudeness. It seems as if Americans are less civil than ever. Earlier this year, the mayor of one major city initiated a campaign to improve the quality of life in his city by encouraging its residents to be nicer to one another. The basic principle behind all of this uh, is that the foundation of any city, the foundation of any civilized society is mutual respect for each other's rights. The city was New York. New York? The city whose main products are rudeness and abrasion? Mayor Rudolph Giuliani wants to crack down on things like blaring car alarms, speeding cabs, and jaywalkers. Despite early ridicule, Giuliani's folly may be working. Most New Yorkers seem receptive. Giuliani isn't the only one who is talking about civility. One of our guests, Stephen Carter, writes in his new book, Civility, that we must make personal sacrifices for a common good and encourage an etiquette of democracy. That, he says, is essential to preserve cherished American institutions like the free market and freedom of speech. Are what Giuliani and Stephen Carter talking about realistic? Is civility something that should be near the top of the policy agenda? Or is this just goody two-shoes stuff with Carter and Giuliani blowing smoke at us? Critics scoff at the notion that civility can be improved, particularly in places like New York. Some, in fact, say incivility and dissent are part of our history of individualism and rude protest may lead to social progress for minority groups and the underprivileged. Our other guest today, Benjamin DeMott, has made the point that incivility is often justified. Gentlemen, uh, Stephen Carter, Benjamin DeMott, thank you very much for uh, joining us. Stephen, it's your book, you're driving the bus. Could you give us a very uh, brief precy of what it's about. Let's hear from Benjamin DeMott and then let's open it up. You know, Ben, complaining about civility is certainly as old as America. And a lot of people, when they think about civility, they think about only manners and etiquette. And if people say manners have declined, that's probably true. But my vision of civility is deeper than that. Civility is really the sum of all the sacrifices that we make for the sake of others. We live in a world where we're encouraged more and more to grab for what we can get to be materialistic, to accumulate here and now. And all of that contributes to a lack of concern about our neighbors, a lack of true good and affection toward others. And all of that is what I mean by incivility. OK. Benjamin DeMott, you uh, have a problem with that. Well, I've got a problem with it, Ben, because it seems to me that, first of all, I don't have a problem with what Stephen is saying about civility. Ah, his book. He describes as a prayer, and it is a religious book. It is a religious address <clears throat> to our society, to the faults and defects of the society. The problem is that Stephen thinks that those problems can be met at the level of personal relationships. 
one person's dealings with another. I know that those relationships are profoundly important, but I also know that the problems that beset the society go beyond interpersonal relationships. They have to do with politics. Stephen turns to the world of religion for his answers. I think it's the world of politics that can provide us with answers. That's the difference, essentially. Uh, you mentioned, Stephen, you said uh, in your opening statement that m more and more we are getting worse and worse. You used that phrase, more and more. Let let's just talk, before we get really into the substance of this thing, is incivility worse than it used to be? You know, I had a conversation not long ago with a very senior uh, politician who was observing what goes on on Capitol Hill nowadays, and he was longing for what he described as the old days, when he said that there would be these sharp disagreements across the aisle, and yet at bottom there was a mutual respect. At bottom, people were willing to, to like each other and certainly to respect each other, to have the sense of being on a common mission. Now, he said, he looks at the new folks in Washington and he worries they have no sense of commonality, they have no sense of mission. Their sense is that these people on the other side are not only their adversaries, but their enemies. And I think that describes more and more of America today. All too often in America, we look at others as utter strangers. The reason personal relationships are crucial is the beginning of any effort to convince people to look at others in a new light is look at the others we see every day, whether friends or strangers. Let me just read you a list. Uh, Road Rage, Howard Stern, uh, Dennis Rodman, the case of the uh, distraught passenger who threw his suitcase at an airline clerk who was pregnant because his reservation wasn't in order, spitting on umpires, uh, Mike Tyson's biting the Evander Holyfield's ear, <clears throat> people shooting each other about sneakers. Uh, could we, in an earlier era, have come up with a similar list? Or is this really something new? Well, we, we might have been able to come up with a list of things we didn't like. What all of these things on that list you mentioned from the book have in common is that all of them involve this sense of giving vent to immediate impulse, giving vent to momentary desire. The entire project of civilization has been a project of training people. These, we come into the world unformed animals and training us to control impulse, to control desire, to use mind and will to avoid, whether it's biting ears or cutting off people in traffic or a variety of different things that we do, giving vent to the impulse of the moment. Well, the problem is, and we're thinking this way, so far as I can see, is this. It says to people, let's take Mayor Giuliani. Mayor Giuliani says the problems of the city are problems of manners. They're the problems of the way people deal with each other, cab drivers and so on. Now, I look at the problems of New York and I say the problems have to do with the schools. The problems have to do with the closing down of after school programs. The problems have to do with all sorts of underfunding, with all sorts of collapse of resources for the public education sector of the city. Now, I can improve my manners, Ben, and most of the people in the city can improve their manners face to face with each other. But they are not going to bring back an after school program that provides some kind of resource for a kid. That's not going to happen but, except through political action. But, but, you know, but you know, Benjamin, I, while I agree with much of what you say, I think that the kind of concern about others that is manifested in what you and I would agree is a good thing, having right. better schools and good after-school programs, that kind of concern is simply on a continuum with the kind of concerns that we show in our everyday interactions. This is fine, Stephen, for you to say and for me to say we're professors. Mayor Giuliani is an elected politician. When he talks about these subjects, he's engaged in a distraction, in a diversion from the political life of the city, which is a life that pits group interests against each other, and they scrap, as they have always scrapped and always will. Let's turn it back. Let's go back to Montgomery, Alabama, uh, Alabama in the days of the bus boycott. We know what the problem was. The problem was that black people were supposed to go to the back of the bus. 
they decided through a political organization by organizing themselves that they would contest they would contest that rule they did contest that rule politically politically and in every other way they organized but and but demonstrated one reason that yeah, that was such a potent movement uh, in in the rest of america is that it was profoundly civil it was not uh, that they weren't insulting people uh, they, they were um, that they, they were taught that even when the brutal cops with the dogs came it is is not not to hit hit back it was it was Gandhi and, and that civility of the civil rights movement uh, is, is something that pushed it forward would you buy that I mean well, or am I, I, I just true. remembering and, wrong in uh, fact a lot of the history of the civil rights <coughs> movement stresses this point that the deeply religious aspect. It wasn't just political. Remember the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, always led by clergy, was very much a church-based organization. And a very important part of the work that the protesters did and their leaders did was what they called purification, preparing themselves right. to maintain a kind of dignity, even a civility, in the face of those who would choose to oppress them by showing that civility, by teaching, you might say, America its table manners. They helped to show the contrast between the dignity and justice of their cause and the indignity and injustice of the other side. On Mayor Giuliani, I would say that I, I don't think that problems of civility have legal solutions. I don't think you can pass a law to make people more civil. And that, therefore, I agree with Benjamin. But I do think that uh, Mayor Giuliani is on, at least, to an important problem, that it really does matter how people treat each other in a city, that the friction of these everyday little slights and little rudenesses can build up into a great deal of stress and lead to greater problems. Let me ask you a question. Uh, Benjamin DeMott, the list that you gave of the sorts of political conditions that get people angry and put them in a rage, schools, for example, mm -hmm. and, and uh, so on. We, we heard the list, and, and it, it was an article that appeared in a uh, very liberal magazine mm -hmm. called The Nation. It, it was a pretty good list of liberal grievances or left of center grievances whatever you want to call it suppose um, someone wrote an article not in the nation about that list of political grievances um, but in national review and said you know why people are so angry mm -hmm. you know why they're going around yelling at people on the road it's because of high taxes spent idiotically it's because we haven't enforced our crime laws it's because there are welfare queens it's because there are racial preferences there are quotas there are I, you, you sure, can do the sure, you can sure. both do the list as well as i can yeah. now are you saying that if the left and your list and your agenda are entitled and it should be encouraged to be uncivil right. and rude and it's in your face right. to get something done well isn't the other team entitled to the same it thing it certainly is there's absolutely no question about that that's what i call political argument political argument is not nice you know that and <coughs> Stephen knows that too it's not nice it's fun sometimes it's fun <laughs> right. and people scrap and it's always given the life and force to the society sometimes that life and force and vitality that has come out of political argument has even produced uh, uh, great works of art. It seems to me what we want to have is a society in which there's argument, in which people give reasons. The argument for civility is an argument without reasons, political reasons. It's an argument for improving our character. Stephen's book is a very improving book in moral terms. I share its belief. I even share its religious faith. But I also know that that faith, that religious faith, is not something that I can take into the political labyrinth and get very far with because there are issues and there are group interests battling each other. Well, you know, you can have argument and it can be very civil as what we're doing uh, right now. We're not calling each other names. Yeah. We're having a disagreement yeah. and it's thoughtful. Right, right. And, may if, get to and if politics were like that, mm -hmm. fewer people would be turned off. We have very good political science data about the links between the drop in voter turnout and the voters' view of politicians as deeply uncivil, negative advertising, and, uh, uh, and so on. But more than that, uh, I don't think we can divorce politics from morality. It's our moral selves. For most Americans, that includes the religious self that helps us understand what it is we want to do 
in politics. When you talk about the, when we talk about the civil rights movement, here you had a movement, a church-based movement, led by a member of the clergy, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, and it was Martin Luther King, not Pat Robertson, who called on his followers to march on the ballot box until we elect a Congress unafraid to right. uh, walk with God. Uh, you have that kind of rhetoric clearly meant to bring into our public life a kind of religious leavening of our other arguments about these difficulties, and I think that was to the good. That was a good thing. And, and, and Reverend Martin Luther King is, was more effective than Reverend Jesse Jackson, who tends to be vituperative at times. I, maybe that's a strong word, but certainly in your face. Well, I certainly think that it's true that the kind of political dialogue, whether religious or not, that is effective, that actually changes people's mind, is not vicious. It may be argumentative, it may be vehement, but it isn't vicious. It is true that people who believe their, in their positions get carried away. They become, you use the word, then vituperative. They become vituperative. They address themselves to others with hostility and anger. We all know that. The question here for me is what is it that will alleviate the condition of the person who is moved to that kind of anger? What is it that we can do? Now, in the kind of anger yeah, that but I'm... if you say it's the nation's agenda and I say it's the National Review's agenda to alleviate these things, where are we? I mean, well, have, we have we moved the ball well, forward? Argument is going to resolve this. That's argument is going to resolve but, this. That's but, Benjamin's but not, point. But not vehement argument. You see, if, reason, if, if, well, no, the giving the, of reasons will, give, will take us to only, some kind of solution. Only if somebody's going to listen. And if you're being vituperative and calling names, you can give all the reasons you want, but all you'll have done is gotten the other side's back up and they won't say anything. But if you take the whole issue, you pretend that the whole issue is an issue of how we treat each other, we will never get to the question of why the schools are closing. Well, take, That's take, the take racism. There, are, there have been only two <clears throat> episodes, I would argue, two times in America's history that have done anything serious about racial equality. One is the abolition of slavery and one is the civil rights movement. Both of those were movements that were deeply involving religious faith, deeply involving a call on us to love one another, and deeply involving an effort to transform the way that we are since that time. In the 30-odd years since the great legislative victories of the Civil Rights Movement, we've made precious little progress toward racial equality, and one of the reasons, I think, for that is precisely that we've turned into a grasping, materialist society, unwilling to call on people to make the genuine sacrifice that we need to make social progress. I have no argument about our grasping materialism. Believe me, that part of your book I thought was terrific. I loved it. What troubles me is the notion that, if you go back to, for example, the abolitionists, and you're telling me that they're preaching love. Wendell Phillips, Wendell Phillips, the great abolitionist preacher called the South, he said, slavery has turned the South into a brothel. Now that is not civil speech if you're a southerner. That's a denunciation, it's vituperative, and there was an awful lot of that kind of speech at that time. And certainly from south, from south to north as well, and, and the other. And ran, ran right. the other way. And it seems to me it's important really to come back all, always to this question. Of what do you want to happen? We want different things if you want to say the left and the right have different agendas, different causes, and they give different reasons. But if you have a lively politics, you can have a conversation and you can get somewhere through that conversation about the issue. Let's talk for a moment about the role of media. Uh, you could have uh, Benjamin DeMott give a speech uh, about all the things he cares most deeply about and give it a 40-minute speech, and there's going to be five seconds where he says something really tough about somebody, and that's going to be all over the evening news. That's the sound bite. Pow! And we have this proliferation of channels and newspapers and inter internet. Good Lord. I mean, you know, they'll say, Benjamin DeMott said so-and-so is a rat fink, or whatever it is they said. Ha has, has this explosion of media intensified the incivility? 
I think the Internet is a case in point, and it's actually especially scary because the Internet in an odd way increases our distance from each other, even as we seek information. Let me give you one simple example. All the newspapers now, a lot of newspapers, they have their online edition, and if you pay money, you can get, not only do you get their online edition, but they'll edit it for you. You get only the pieces of that newspaper that you want. If you only want sports, you get that. If you only want oil and gas prices, you get that. So what's lost is the role of the media in helping make us uh, uh, people with something in common through the exercise of news judgment of editors who will say, these are all the things you need to know. And then on the evening news, of course, everyone uh, talks about it. There's nothing new in it. But one of the things that really troubles me about civility and the evening news uh, is the way that if there's a contested issue in American politics and we want to have the kind of argument that we've been talking about, what a producer wants to do is get the most extreme person on one side, get the most extreme person on the other side, get them to call each other names, which is apparently is good television. The purpose but of this also program, that when, it, when we started it four full years ago, was to get away from that, to get away from the crossfire mentality. I mean, it's an interesting program, which I watch at times, but when they call you to be a guest, they say, well, what do you think of this on a scale of zero to, nine, zero to 100? And if you're not at zero to 10 or 90 to 100, they say, Ben, we'll get back to you next time. I mean, they are, yeah. and I've even they, moderated that. They want, they want to do entertainment. And right. not only do they then present a model to all of us and to our children as well, that the way you resolve things is by yelling and screaming at each other, but they also, and this is the important thing, they also present a false image of America. They make us seem much more divided as, than we are right. well, by picking only the extremes. Let's go back to Mayor Giuliani. Let's go back to the question of civility. Civility in politics, as Mayor Giuliani uses it, is itself an entertainment. It's a distraction. It's a way of saying, no, I don't want to talk about budget cuts. No, I don't want to talk about the closing of Harlem Hospital. I don't want to talk about after school programs. I want to talk about what I don't have any fundamental responsibility well, for. I think that's an unfair rap on, on, on Giuliani. Tell I me mean, why. he has been, well, I'll tell you, because he has been a very substantive mayor on very important issues. Whether you like, I mean, you know, what has happened with crime in New York City, which was issue number one there. Like it or not, he, he sure did something. I mean, this whole broken windows theory and the squeegee men and cracking down on the murder rates come way down and so on and so forth. Violent crimes come way down. Uh, and, and the changes in the welfare system. And you can go down a long list. He, he has not been a, a mayor who has been without substance. Well, I know this uh, program I mean, is not about Mayor Julian. Well, and, I, and I don't want to make, and I don't want to make it. I, but I do think it's important to put into the equation that the level of fear among working class, particularly black working class people in the city of the police, I don't think has ever been higher than it has been in the last few years under the Mayor Giuliani regime. Well, so what, what, here's this incivility that you describe. It's a problem, but what can you do about it? The, the only thing that's going to change our incivility, and again, I want to emphasize that our incivility is much more than manners. It's linked to all the kinds of social problems I believe that Benjamin's been talking about. The only way we're going to change that is through a transformation of self. It is not the case that transformation of self is impossible. I mentioned earlier the abolitionist movement and the civil rights movement, both of which were largely about persuading people to change what was in their hearts, to get them to care about other people more as a way of transforming the nation. Both of those were deeply religious movements, and it strikes me that only a revival of religion at its best, not the kind of quasi-political religion we see now, which is often religion at its worst, but only religion at its best, calling people to genuine sacrifice for others, calling people to follow the biblical command to love the neighbor. Only that is going to begin to make a change if people try to follow it. And then inspired, I hope, by that example, we will see others try to undergo the same transformation. If we don't do that, then I think these other social problems are going to get worse and not better because most of them at root come from our unwillingness to care in a serious way about other people. I think that, that an organized populace, that organized political parties arguing about public education and coming clean about what it means, what the failures of contemporary public education mean to the future of the society. I believe that political parties and political spokesmen dealing with those issues and not calling for a religious rebirth, but dealing with those issues in serious and concrete terms, can affect a change in the quality of life of the community. 
Thank you both uh, very much, uh, Stephen Carter and Benjamin DeMott. And thank you. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. We at Think Tank depend on your views to make our show better. Please send your questions and comments to New River Media, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C. 20036. Or email us at thinktank at pbs.org. To learn more about Think Tank, visit PBS online at www.pbs.org. And please let us know where you watch Think Tank. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.